Hello and welcome everyone to Teslanomics Live. I'm your host, Ben Sullins, and this is the show where we break down the latest Tesla news from the week that has passed. We do it live because, as you know, things move quickly in the world of Tesla and Elon Musk, and today is no different. If you're new here, the show will run about an hour. There's a big Q&A section at the end, which I host on Crowdcast, but I broadcast here, so you can follow along. But if you want to be a part of that conversation, you need to join our email list to get your invite, and you can do so for free at teslanomics.co slash join. Simple as that, and then Mondays before the show, you'll get an invite, and you'll hop on there if you're one of the first 140 or 150 people, and uh, we'll have a conversation here. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining Joining me on Crowdcast, on YouTube, on Facebook, wherever you may be watching from, because we have a lot of fun stuff to cover today. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is actually a new channel that I created for highlight videos. If you guys have been following along for a while now, we've been what we've been doing is having the live show here, which will cover maybe four, maybe five stories sometimes. And most people probably aren't going to watch that full thing. So what we were doing was cutting it up into little videos and posting those on subsequent days on the channel. Well. As many of you wrote in and let us know, you, we were clogging up your feed of stuff you'd already watched, so we wanted to kind of streamline that. And so what we did, is we just created a separate channel just for the highlights. So if you miss anything here and you're just curious or maybe you don't like watching the full hour show, whatever, the you know timing doesn't work for you, you can go check that out. Um, I'll put a link on there. You can uh, subscribe at teslanomics.co slash HL. That'll just redirect you over to that channel and you'll get kind of more of the bite-sized versions of the stories that we cover here on the regular show. So please um, go check that out. Subscribe if you're so inclined and um, thanks for, for the support yet again. Okay, the first story I want to talk about is kind of nuts. Um, it started, or at least my research into it started, when I was looking at what was going on with production. This is we're in a really critical time right now as as Q3 kind of winds down. And if you recall, Elon Musk kind of promising or being very hopeful. I don't know what the right terminology is that they would uh, that they would become profitable in Q3 or Q4 of this year. So it's crunch time, and Tesla has been working around the clock to try to get these cars out there. And, and that, that seems to be happening. A lot of what we're seeing online from the Bloomberg tracker and other reports show that production numbers are doing well. They're producing the Model 3, which is kind of the linchpin of their whole profitability path uh, at, at, a, at a fast clip. Now, if we wanted to actually plug that into a model, here's my forecast model that I've been using forever. And on this forecast model, you can see that if we were to plug in, I think, uh, what did Inside EV say? Uh, production is 67 in the last seven days, turning towards 8,000 a week. So let's say by September 14th, they had 6,700. We can plug that into our model here. We know that they produced 1,000 per week in the, the first week of this year, which seems like ancient history. Um, but we can just go uh, plug these numbers in and see what kind of shakes it. I haven't done this yet, so uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see. All right, so we've got, okay, let's try that again. September 14th. They were at 6,700, it said. So let me scroll that guy up close enough, 6,742. So if that's the case, and this model here is a log growth S-curve, which is the one that Elon and everyone else claims that how basically manufacturing models work with production, and assuming the top peak production per week at 10,000, which may be possible now with the, uh, uh, the, the, the line, the manufacturing line they built in a tent, uh, that may actually be close to possible. We're looking at, in 2018, close to 250,000 Model 3s produced. Now, this number assumes, as you can kind of tell by the line there, a very perfect uh, path. However, um, that's of course not really not really the case. And so, um, what you know, it'll be somewhere in this ballpark. Uh, I'm guessing, you know, if they can if they can get 200,000 Model 3s produced this year, that will be phenomenal. I I, th I think that'll be a, a huge win uh, for Tesla. So that's where I was going with this. Um, and if you haven't seen this, it's on my website, teslanomics.co. You can just go check it out. Now, then I saw this tweet uh, from Megan Gale that there are 42 Teslas sitting at, at the Union Pacific Railroad in Salt Lake City, Utah. My car is one of these. I've been told I was getting delivery the 8th, then the 15th, <laughs> then the 20th, then the 22nd, and now my delivery has been delayed indefinitely. Uh, Elon, Tesla, please make this right now. Uh, my buddy Zach 
also is in, in this situation, and he is also in Utah. And it, it seems to come down to something about the laws in Utah and how many vehicles they're allowed to have on a lot at a time. And there's some kind of weird stuff going on there because Utah, if you don't recall, was one of the states that basically banned the sale of Teslas until very recently. And it has to do with dealerships and kind of all these weird little loopholes and laws that have been around for a long time. And until somebody like Tesla came and challenged the model for how cars are sold to people uh there was never really a problem right you know toyota honda all these guys just kind of work the standard way of course tesla doesn't do that they do things their own way and so little odd weird things like this happen to me this was fascinating um so if you scroll down there's a shot here that is pretty incredible uh, of all these cars basically being held now they're not on a train uh but they are in the train parking lot and uh, apparently she counted 42 of them here and the amazing thing is that uh, elon actually responded to this and he said sorry we've gone from production hell to delivery logistics hell but this problem is far more tractable we're making rapid progress should be solved shortly now if you recall Tesla had done something recently, I believe it was in Santa Monica or San Francisco, where they were doing these kind of mass delivery events where they would deliver maybe 50, 100 cars at a time. Instead of having 5 to 10 to 15 minutes per car, you could maybe do 30 or 40 minutes, even an hour, for 50 cars or 100 cars. You would save a huge amount of time that way. So that maybe is what Elon is referring to um, when he talks about that. This whole situation seems seems absurd to me. It's really wild, and you know, to me, it, it alludes to essentially this uh, this problem that most many. I don't want to say most, but many business leaders have where they don't think of their business as a system. Let me pull it in here so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So when we start when you start a business you have all the different aspects of it right you have sales marketing or not marketing in tesla's case um operations production fulfillment customer service finance accounting you have all these different areas right and the way a lot of companies go about doing it is they kind of focus heavily on one area and neglect another area. And that's exactly what's happening here. Tesla was focusing tremendously on production, which they should be. It's a really hard nut to crack. But they weren't focusing nearly as much attention on delivery. And as well, the next thing down the chain will be service. Um, and so all of these things play off each other. They all are connected. And so you can't really do one without also doing the other. Me, having worked in corporate America for many years, encountered this firsthand where you would see you know, my team supporting a, a, a sales group, let's say, with, with reports and charts and analysis that they're literally asking for on a daily basis to go sell our product they 5x their team and my team gets zero additional people and you wonder why things suffer right this is like the main one of the main problems with how most businesses run is it's a game of whack-a-mole now elon self-proclaimed not a great businessman much better engineer and i think most people would agree with that is is also falling um f falling susceptible to that so i think uh the story here is that hopefully they're realizing that they need to really think about their operations the whole business as as one unit and if you want to do 10 10x over here you're going to have to figure out how much you need in all the other areas to support 10x in production or 10x in sales or whatever the case may be so uh gail or megan uh, Zach, everyone in Utah that's waiting on your car, I hope you guys get it soon. I hope they figure this out. Obviously, there's like some weird logistics and laws and dumb things happening here, but it seems that the the problem has gone from production to delivery, then to it'll be service probably on, on the next end. If any of you guys are in California and you've been to your service center uh, recently, you know how insanely busy and kind of swamped they are. So it's, it's one of those things. Oh, it's just another growing pain. The good news is there's still tons of people taking delivery of cars. There's still, you know, tons of people waiting on it. And as Q3 ramps up, we may be actually getting close to profitability, which will be a huge win for Tesla and really solidify their future. 
going forward. So let me know what you guys think about that. If you're in this situation, I'd love to hear your story. If you have photos, documents, anything that you feel comfortable sharing, uh, please just hit me up on Twitter, DM me, um, because I think this is a story that's going to continue to evolve and one that that I personally uh, am interested in, in following. So, so l let me know on that um, as things kind of go on. All right. So next, I want to talk about something that's pretty fun. Let me pull it up here. And this is some data that I've been churning on this past week around phantom drain now if you guys are unfamiliar i am a part of a company called tesla and we have an app that helps you track your kind of stats on your car it's kind of like a fitbit for your tesla right it'll tell you all kinds of things about your efficiency um, in, in phantom drain and all these other different aspects of how you're basically what you're getting out of your tesla so it's a free app and i'll link you to something special i'm announcing here towards the end of this uh, but i wanted to go through some recent data that I had pulled from our fleet of cars. And just to, this is a lot of numbers on the screen. Let me just walk you through it. Um, basically, what we're looking at is phantom drain. So when your car sits there, it will lose some charge, some amount, just like your phone does and things like that. Anything with a, a battery will have a very slow kind of drain just by, you know, uh, just by running background processes or in the case of Tesla's, typically it's uh, keeping the battery at, at a good temperature to preserve its kind of longevity. Now, in our study, the data I'm looking at here, we have almost 800 or 857,000 records. So a record in this case is what I call a trip. And a trip, think of it like a driving trip, right? You drove into work today, whatever the case may be, and that was a trip. We log that as a singular event. A phantom trip in this context is anytime your car is in idle for greater than 30 minutes. Now we do track all of them below that as well. We literally track, you know, a 10 minute phantom trip. But for this study, what I was curious about were uh, trips that were longer than that, right? A typical thing where your car is either sitting in the parking lot while you're at the grocery store, while you're at work, or just overnight. Um, so of those, we have 857,000 records, 857,000 trips that we're analyzing. Uh, those break down to 227,000 trips for Model X, 87,000 trips for Model 3, and 543,000 trips for Model S. These are just the cars that are in the fleet. You can see the number of vehicles we're looking at is over 7,000 now, over 4,000 Model S, 1,200, almost 1,300 Model 3, and almost 1,500 Model X. So a huge study, right? Lots of data that we're looking at here. And there's a couple different ways to look at this. So what I'm trying to do is figure out this median drain. And so if you just took an average or a sum, those numbers are wildly different, right? We have a lot of data that is kind of uh, fuzzy or noisy where, you know, who knows what happened? The car drained a tremendous amount in a very short period of time. Um, and, and we log that and that's an anomaly. So I take the median to kind of find that signal there and, and eliminate all, all the fuzziness, all the noise. Um, but here are kind of the overall stats that we're looking at. So the median drain for trips that are 30 minutes or more uh, for all these different models is 1.32 miles, 1.68 miles, and 1.36 miles. Now you can notice that the Model 3 is, is a, a quite a bit higher. It still doesn't sound like a lot, but it is quite a bit higher. Um, and then if, to extrapolate that out, if the car were to sit for 24 hours at this rate, here is essentially what you would be looking at for the daily drain. Now, I wanted to look at a distribution and just see kind of where these are at. And you can see that they're actually all very similar. So 56% uh, of the Model S in our study had a uh, 0 to 1.7 miles drain, uh, 1.7 on the Model 3. This was 56% uh, as well, and 56.99, 56. Point. So most of the trips in this study were, you know, zero to two, two miles of drain, which is great because that means that, you know, on, on mass, most people aren't going to have a tremendous problem with this. There have been lots of stories online about people having tremendous amounts of drain. And in fact, that's why I wanted to do this study. So there's kind of where that's at. Now, 
looking at a trend of this, you can kind of see uh, week by week, you know, they been they jumped up and that now now they're kind of jumping down and we're at like a fairly decent rate. We're at a fairly decent place where a lot of the drain is really coming down to, you know, under 1 mile for each of these trips. So, I think the story is that it's getting better. Um, now, there are some other cases and I know some of the other apps that track these kind of things. A lot of people have sent me screenshots of them. They don't necessarily uh, do, they haven't really been as sensitive to it as we have. And I, I can't speak to those details, but I have seen other people where they installed one of these stats apps and then overnight they're getting 20, 30 miles of drain. And so I wanted to point out that we uh, took a lot of care and a lot of time and looked at this data to make sure that when we are pinging the car, we're not waking it up because that tends to create a ton of phantom drain for the Model 3 specifically. On the Model S and X, when we were pinging it to see the status of the car, is it idle, is it driving, etc. It wasn't nearly as bad. It wasn't causing that same effect. Um, so initially, when we first got the Model 3, we did a lot of testing. And if I were to show you this same data from months ago, then essentially that's what you would see. You would see just kind of spikes all over the place. But now we've got it down to where it's pretty good. So in general, I, we feel good about this. Now, if you look at the trends by software version, it is a mess. <laughs> this was something else. So we were trying to figure out like, all right, is there a soft specific software version that, that stood out that caused a ton of drain? Not really. Uh, there, there are definitely some kind of trends here, but overall, no, it, it, it didn't really, uh, di didn't really add up. And then when you look at the forecasts, everything is headed in this direction towards zero. So that way there's less and less drain. Now I have talked to Tesla about this in the past and they have stated that they were aware with the Model 3 early on that there were some issues. And so they're, they've been working on them. And some of you guys may notice that as you get different versions, you see all kinds of different weird things happen. For example, I noticed recently that, you know, my, my garage is on the other side of my living room. And so if I'm sitting in my living room with my phone, uh, watching TV or whatever, maybe, maybe watching Teslanomics highlights, you you know, as, as, as you should be doing at night, um, your your car uh, will be connected to your phone. I get this notification now. So it's like, you know, Tez connected. And so, you know, I have these these ideas that like maybe those things are are ones that are um, that are that, that are causing some of these problems. I'm not sure. Uh, but in general, you know, again, 857,000 trips, 7,000 vehicles analyzed in this study. Things are looking fairly good. You can see the Model S very down the Model X down, Model 3 trending slightly down, right? Because it's still, I think as, as the software gets better and better, you're going to see, uh, you're going to see, uh, you know, th this, all of these kind of c come down to, to be almost zero. Now, if you wanted to look at color, I just thought this might be a fun thing. Um, here is in our study, median drain by color. Interestingly enough, solid black is one of the best ones. Don't know why, um, but you know, and you can see some of these other ones here. These other cars are uh, 1.68, 1.69, 1.29. So it's all pretty similar. But um, you know, if you throw in the Model S, uh, they're they're you know on mass you know quite better, with the exception of the signature red. Don't know why. Um, and if you throw in the Model X, let's just see. Let's do Model Three compared to Model X. Um, you can see, yeah, that they're all quite a bit uh, better, with the exception of, of the silver metallic and the solid black. So, you know, good signs in terms of Phantom Drain. I'm going to revisit this from time to time. Um, if you guys are interested in uh, in getting, let me pull it up here. If you guys are interested in trying out Tesla, you can go to teslanomics.co slash TZ. Uh, it's a free app. It works on Android and iOS. We also have this in-car dashboard. If you have a Model S or X, you can, um, and maybe one day when the Model 3 gets a browser. If you live in the East Coast and right now, you know, right storm season, it's kind of coming into fall and all that, this stuff starts to matter. We actually built a, a web-based dashboard that will show you things like a Doppler radar. Um, so as you're driving, you can kind of tell what clouds are coming up and those kind of things. Me out here on the West Coast, I you know don't necessarily <laughs> uh, have as much use of that, but I know a lot of folks on the East Coast have that uh, or, or get use out of that. So totally free. Um, we don't store your password or, or anything like that ever. We just use it to generate a token. So it's really secure. We're very, very focused on security and privacy as well as it, the effect it has when we ping the car. Um, you can see, you know, here's uh, Ben and Will, um, the, the founders of it. 
And here are some examples of what it looks like. So you can see, you know, you can track what's going on, you can review it, and then you can kind of compare it with your friends. There's fun things you can do along that. So uh, go to teslanomics.co slash TZ, and it will actually enroll you into a beta for the car control. So we're rolling out new controls for the car that you can unlock it, and you can do almost everything that you can do from the regular Tesla app, but now in ours. So that way you you know kind of don't really need the main Tesla app, um, and you can just use this one. So you won't have to be like balance back with, uh, back and forth between them or anything like that. So uh, there you go. Uh, go to teslanomics.co slash TZ, check it out. Let me know what you guys think. Ping me on the Twitters and the Facebooks in all the places. All right, next I want to talk about something more fun that I have going on with some friends of mine, and this is a new podcast. So if you're uh, if you're into more than just Tesla and things that are Elon related, and you want to talk about space, um, you want to talk about uh, science, any of this fun stuff, uh, my friend Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, and uh, Joe Scott, who has a great channel called Answers with Joe, um, which he breaks down some really interesting uh, topics in, in the world in terms of science and all those kind of things and has a very humorous way of looking at it. Uh, we're getting together every week to talk uh, talk about these things. So yeah, this is a new podcast. You can go check it out at ourludicrousfuture.com. We also have a YouTube channel, uh, you know, channel art coming soon. <laughs> um, and yeah, this is just basically us talking about the latest news, kind of what's going on. You know, here we dive deep into the Tesla stuff. We do the data and all that. On this show, we kind of talk more broadly about a lot of these things, how they're changing our future and kind of what's going on there. So uh, go have fun with that and uh, you'll get even more of me and my friends talking about this geeky stuff. Okay, next I want to talk about something that is a question I've got quite a lot of and this is from uh, you guys asking me essentially uh, how to go solar, how I went solar, what uh, what choices I made, what the effect has been, all that. Because if you have a Model 3 now or you know very soon, um, you're probably going to be looking at your electricity bill in a month or two and go, oh crap, we should figure something out. And so I just wanted to break down how I did that and point you to the resources I used as long as show you some of the data here. So this is my monthly energy use uh, for my house. Um, um, I pulled this just uh, just before the show here, so you can see. You know, some months we're using quite a bit of energy. Uh, other months, you know, not not so much. And then other months we're actually giving back. So like June uh, it was a, a net um, a, a net return to the grid. And so we have a cool thing in San Diego called net energy metering, which basically treats the grid like a giant battery. So uh, when my when I'm not at home, when no one's at home, and our solar panels are there um, generating energy, we're selling that to the grid, um, and then. And they are essentially giving us credits and then at night when we don't have any energy uh you know we're still waiting on our power walls uh we buy it back so um that's essentially what's going on not everywhere has that there is they did introduce a tax so it's not as good as it used to be but it's still fine it's still like a, a really effective way of uh, of kind of arbitraging uh, any rates or any, or any uh, energy costs. So here's what my bill looks like, or this is my energy consumption. And currently, thanks to an SDG, SDG and &E, uh, credit that they offered, I have like a negative $500 balance. So like they owe me 500 bucks, essentially, they'll never actually pay me that. But I'll essentially have a credit forever where I, I, I don't spend uh, any money on electricity. And I have two electric vehicles. So that is kind of what I would highly recommend for a lot of folks out there. Once you get one electric vehicle, um, depending on where you live, but most places, you're going to be in a great situation for for solar. It just makes a lot of sense. Um, it, you know, if you look at the, the math behind the money that you'd spend on that over time, tremendous value. It really, it really do, does make sense. And here's kind of you know my data to show that. Now. The, the system I have has something called solar edge monitoring. So here's, this is really cool. Again, more fun data. Uh, this shows you essentially how, uh, what type of, uh, I'm sorry, how much energy my system is generating um, every single month. Or right now it's looking at, at a daily rate here. So you can kind of see, you know, we're upwards of 25 kilowatt hours, maybe approaching 30, 30 kilowatt hours a day. Um, and you can see o over time what that looks like. So this is just fascinating to me. Now, when I get my power walls, I'll be able to kind of see how all of this ties in but right now this is like the typical setup so it's really cool because you get to see this and it's just this amazing feeling that like literally my transportation is powered by the sun 
just and, and you know the majority of the rest of our home is i like don't even have to think about an electricity bill and coming from phoenix where we would spend five six hundred bucks a month on electricity because we had multiple air conditioners this is tremendous so i highly recommend going this way now the tool that i use to do it is called energy sage and they are uh, an affiliate of mine and i highly recommend their product because i used it and then later went back to them and said hey can i recommend this to other people um and and, and they said yeah absolutely so I used Energy Sage without any, you know, without with the intention of becoming an affiliate just because I loved their product because I heard about it from folks in the industry and now they're, they're, they're a supporter of the show and an affiliate of mine. So what they offer is this product right here. To me, this is the, the, the killer product besides their blog, which is great. This is uh, the marketplace. And so it if you're looking to go solar, you can come here, you can uh, set up that you, you upload your electricity bill, you do Google map like pin uh, to show your roof and then installers come and then they can bid on your, on your, on your project. Now they don't ever get your personal information until you choose to share it with them. So you don't go here, upload your info and bam, you're just getting bombarded by phone calls or anything like that. It doesn't work that way. It's all handled here in this thing. I, I call it a dashboard. They call it the market marketplace um, and so essentially you know you can see the installers uh, ratings and reviews about them uh, labor warranty uh, you know all, all kinds of different uh, specs to me the price per watt is important because this is essentially telling you which one of these is the cheapest the upfront cost um, overall 20 year savings and these kind of things um, payback period uh, and then you know the loan option essentially what it would cost so you can see just like off off the bat at the very top what's going on with it and it's tremendous so when you when you're looking at solar to me this was like gold because I can look at all the data and the facts behind these things instead of having to try to navigate that myself when I'm completely clueless about how how this stuff works um, so you can talk about the installer they have more data there and then they get into the equipment which to me is fascinating because they tell they tell you about the panel uh, manufacturer and then um, the panel model which isn't listed here this is just a demo but it'll tell you this specific type of panel so that way um, you can go look it up and you can see reviews of it and those kind of things um, then you have you know panel ratings warranties the the monitoring technology solar edge which is what I just showed you that I have um, and as well as the inverter type which I was aware of uh, before but now I, I know much more information about the warranty all that kind of stuff and you can see the image of the installation system they can kind of map it out where it's going to be all that kind of just how many watts per panel how many panels etc etc so I'm a huge fan of this uh, because you know I used it and found great value in it. Uh, I also got a quote from Tesla, um, and because they, they weren't participating at the time, and actually at the time it was Solar City, and um, and, and that's what I did. You know, I asked them essentially these questions. I went into the conversation much, much more knowledgeable. So. Um, I don't know if Tesla will actually participate in these kind of quote systems, but uh, what I would do, what I would highly recommend, if you you know have an electric car or getting an electric car soon, I assume you're getting a Tesla if you're watching me talk about this, uh, I would go to teslanomics.co slash solar, you sign up for Energy Sage, it's totally free and, you know, to you, you don't have to spend any money or anything like that, and then Upload your stuff and get a quote even before you get your car if you don't have it already. Uh, so that way you can you can kind of plan ahead and think about that. Then when it comes time, if you want to talk to Tesla as well, you will have quotes and you'll have a great understanding about how all of these things work. Uh, this is just a, a demo, but each of these little things they have this little uh, this question mark over them. You can hover over that and get more info about it. So I wanted to share this with you guys because I've literally got like dozens of emails about hey. You know, I know you went solar. What did you get and all that? So there's my data. There's like direct, you know, um, uh, from like my, <laughs> my my actual energy usage, my monitoring system, and the system I use. So I hope that helps you guys. If you have questions or anything like that, feel free hit me up on Twitter. Leave a comment down below, um, and I'll try to point you guys in the right direction. Okay, next uh, I have some a story that that's kind of. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I feel happy. It's like bittersweet. 
I don't know how to describe this, uh, but let's start here. So Tesla, uh, Elon uh, talked about this, I think on the shareholder meeting a while ago, that they wanted to open up their own body shops. Well, they've actually done it. Um, so you can see that Tesla now has these body repair centers available for light collision repair in these cities. Um, and there's one near me in Van Nuys, California, which is a, a suburb, I guess, a part of LA. So it's not too far. And uh, they have one in a Marriott of Georgia, which I believe is a suburb of Atlanta. This is fantastic because body repair is probably Tesla's like biggest sore spot for people that are owners. Um, anyone that's ever had this, the costs are tremendous. The delays are forever. Uh, and, and there's kind of two reasons behind that. Um, one is that Tesla is notoriously slow at delivering parts. I know that I've got questions here about this. People have commented and sent me emails all over the time saying it's going to be six, seven months for a part. And you're like, what is going on? The installers know what they're doing. They work on, you know, hundreds of different types of cars. They're, they're certified. They're all these kind of things. Um, but mostly getting the parts is, is the challenge. So these stores, Elon has stated, will essentially be uh, stocked with the parts and of course they're only going to work on Tesla's so you have you know three models currently and they'll be able to be a lot more efficient as a result so this is actually a great sign especially for anybody that doesn't have their car yet because if you do have any issues you'll have one of these options I just waited two weeks uh, to get mine back and I wasn't able to even get the parts I had to do just a regular body repair Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It was it was a painful experience. The the company I worked with, um, you know, did a great job, but it just kind of sucked, right? It it just always sucks in any time that you're in a situation like that. So, this uh, you know, came to light to me from my friend Kim, uh, who just posted this video, which you have to go watch if you haven't. Um, where their Model 3, uh, somebody backed into it and it caused a severe amount of damage. I mean, this is like a lot of stuff to be replaced here. Um, and they actually were able to uh, to get it repaired at the, the service of uh, the body repair shop in Georgia uh, within, I think, 24 hours, 25 hours, something like that. Let me see. And, and so you can see it got, you know, essentially here's what they had fixed. Uh, they, they had, this is called, I believe, the quarter panel, a uh, headlight, the wheel, and and the the, the front bumper. All, all replaced um, within a couple days. I think it was like Thursday or Wednesday to Friday or something like that. That is amazing. Um, and it does make a lot of sense, right? If Tesla can stock these parts and train people, I mean, it's not hard on just these three cars, then they can really crank these things out. And so I love that they're doing this. Uh, I, I hope, you know, they can really scale it out because this definitely is one of the biggest problems um, that, that that they've had. And, and again, um, I, I don't, you know, it's funny. This part, I have a lot of faith that, that they'll be able to do this incredibly well, like this will be easy for them the part i have i i don't have as much faith with uh with them is when it comes to the um the invoicing dealing with insurance and stuff like that like today tesla hasn't been the best at handling things like invoicing or financing or you know the kind of paperwork behind uh delivering their cars for example so kim uh, reported that it was great things went incredibly well if you want to see more um I'll, I'll put i think it's already there a link to this video um in, down in in, uh, in the description so check it out um but yeah all good news you know it's actually just just getting better and better i really hope that you know along with this they double their service center because that is where you know you're anticipating it right you go from massive amounts of production to then delivery problems cool then we do and we up deliveries then we need service right and all these kind of things so we already know that that's coming um this is just one more thing that they're doing to help kind of uh, solve for that in advance of it so great news um let me know what you guys think if you're near one of these locations if you have a body issue currently call them up i think they have a phone number at the top here yeah to call, call the tesla body shop um see if they can help you out so great news uh hope you guys like that um tell me what you think down in the comments below okay 
Um, next, I want to talk about something that uh, was a big deal. It just ended yesterday was the referral program. And no, I'm not going to try to push my code on you and ask you to go buy a Tesla with my code uh, because it's kind of dead at this point, honestly. Uh, or that, that's, that's my thoughts on it. Here uh, is the latest from the referral program for Tesla. So if you're unfamiliar at all, uh, up until last night, midnight, California time, or you know, just uh, just about 12 hours ago, uh, you could order a, a Tesla uh, Model SX or Performance Model 3 and get free and limited supercharging for life. Now, uh, if you do that and you use a referral code, you can get a $100 credit um, towards supercharging. And that credit, uh, depending on how you drive, can get you, you know, uh, like I mapped it out, maybe about halfway from San Diego to New York. So, you know, it's it's a decent amount of uh, of. of of distance it's not like you know a short amount of distance or anything but it definitely is something that you know it isn't quite like the free unlimited forever kind of supercharging so it's the program's gone elon even tweeted about it it's not coming back um the question i still have and and i i asked uh, my, my buddy there if you can clarify is that there's a a piece here that says let me see. Credits awarded for qualifying referrals are valid for 12 months from the referred uh, referral vehicle delivery date or solar date and can be used towards services, vehicle accessories, or new Tesla products. Um, so to me, what this sounds like is the person that does the referring, the referrer, uh, whatever credit they get will only be valid for 12 months versus the person but it is a little confusing because you don't necessarily get a credit unless you're doing the solar like if you re if you uh, refer a solar uh, uh install from tesla you receive 400 dollars cash or 750 dollars credit etc uh whereas uh here you get kind of these prizes so i don't know what they're talking about with a credit other than the hundred dollar supercharging credit which would be really weird if like you bought the car and you had to use a hundred dollar supercharging credit within the first year so uh, i'm trying to get clarity on that but it ended uh that's where we stand um i don't imagine you guys are too interested in me talking about how many more i got yesterday or the past couple days uh, but just needless to say anyone that used my code Thank you. I appreciate you. You have my, e my my personal email. Feel free to contact me anytime you have questions or anything like that. So there you have it. Curious to see what's going on now because this program has generated well over a billion dollars in sales for them over the past couple of years. And we'll see. We'll see. Oh, uh, in one note, it does appear that on the app, and let me see if I can bring it up. Uh, it does appear that the, uh, the, the Roadster discount lives on and so that was one of the questions i and many others had is like okay cool are they going to end the program and then you know besides these little uh five or six things they have here you know the black wall connector etc um are they going to end the part where where they uh, give you the roadster discount and it does not appear so so let me bring that up here and show you that it's it's still there let me see if you can see that whoop there there it is so you can see that um, on in the app, it still shows the ability to earn um, a discount towards a Roadster. So, yeah, keep the keep it coming, you know, especially uh, for those folks that, that haven't reached that. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. OK, uh, last story before we get to the Q&A is that ChargePoint is growing their EV charging network to 2.5 million, which is a 50 fold increase in the total number of chargers. So the statement here says, ChargePoint operator, one of the world's largest charging station networks for electric vehicles, is targeting a near 50-fold increase in its global network of loading spots by the middle of the next decade. That's 2025. It said in a statement on Friday, the group in which German companies BMW, Daimler, who makes Mercedes, and Siemens hold stakes aims to operate 2.5 million charging points by 2025, up from a network of around 53,000 currently. So that's cool. Uh, I'm all for this. That's awesome. Uh, personally, I don't and probably won't ever use ChargePoint uh, just because I don't need it because I charge at home and I have Teslas where, you know, we have destination charging and, and uh, supercharging and those kind of things. But for the general mass adoption of electric vehicles, I do feel that a, a strong charging network is a key component, a key component. And, you know, the interesting thing about it is, um, 
that as vehicles, as electric cars get longer and longer range, I'm not sure how important these slow charge points are going to be. Um, what I mean by that is most of these uh, th that I'm aware of and um, are the uh, J1772 level two chargers. Uh, technical stuff, but basically around 25, 30 miles of range per hour. And this is what you can get at home if you install, you know, a, a, a NEMA 1450 outlet, kind of like a, a, a dryer outlet, you know, a, a setup. Uh, you can get that same kind of thing there, you know, as you can get here. And so as electric cars start to have three, maybe 400 miles, maybe 500 miles of range. It's one of those things where even with my model three at 310 miles, I would charge like twice a week, maybe, right? I could literally go five, six days driving to work and back running errands without having to charge. Now, not everyone is in that boat. I know, but for a lot of folks, you know, your commute is like 20 miles each way. And so you can go uh, quite a while without having to charge. And so you have your, your home charging, which is cheaper than this, and you don't have to do it on a daily basis. So where is the market? I don't see the value or the need. Now, when your car only gets 60 or 80 miles on a rain, on a charge, I completely understand how valuable these are. So I'm in, I'm a fan, I'm a fan of this. I think though that like the, the strategy, and, and this is basically all the details we have here. The strategy should be on these, uh, th these, these high power, the DC fast chargers, level three chargers, as they would call them still not quite as fast as a supercharger, but acceptable, like, like good enough for a road trip. I think they should essentially start to implement something like the supercharger network that Tesla's built where, you know, if you're in Europe, for, for example, where they have a lot of them, you're going to want to drive from, I don't know, Paris to Madrid or something like that. Uh, and, and you would be able to do so. Um, because right now at a level two charger, it's really just not, not feasible it's not going to fly so i'm excited about this i don't know what the strategy is i hope the strategy is to try to enable long distance transportation and not just your standard level two chargers because i don't know if we really need 2.5 million of them by 2025 again uh, by 2020 tesla will be making a car an electric car that goes over 600 miles on a charge you could go a couple weeks without having to charge that up so you don't need something like you know something you have to pay for that's more expensive than at home at the grocery store, just, just not necessary. The only time that those things are truly necessary is when you have a very short range car, uh, which is like the older first generation EVs. And God bless anyone that's actually uh, driving one of those because you guys are really the early adopters. You know, I bought a Tesla as my first EV. Yeah, I mean, I am I feel like I'm doing good out there, but uh, certainly the folks that were driving the, the Nissan Leafs, uh, you know, Gen 1, you guys were, 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 were uh, definitely doing more for the cause, cause than I was. So there you have it. Let's jump over to Q&A now. And I'm going to go to Patreon first. You just refresh, refresh, refresh. Actually, there it is. Let's pull it up. Chamburn asks, and by the way, if you were wondering how to get on this, you uh, go subscribe on Patreon. I think uh, $1 a month is, is the minimum, and then you can ask these questions, kind of get your questions answered first. Take a drink of water here, and uh, we'll take a look. Uh, Chamber's asking about a timeline of basically everything that's going on with Elon stuff. Um, I don't know if there's any published anything uh, out there, and some of these things come up r rather quickly before they get announced publicly. So uh, maybe uh, maybe listen to our podcast, ourludicrousfuture.com. Go check it out because we'll be talking about every uh, this stuff every single week. Thanks for the question. That's it for Patreon. Cool. Let's go over now to. Crowdcast, where we have 19 questions. There we are. And the reason Crowdcast is cool is because there's two big things, two reasons why I love it. First off, it's kind of like you have to take just one extra step. It's all free, right? But uh, or free for you guys. I have to pay for it. But uh, it's like one extra step to get into Crowdcast, which means you, a lot of the trolls and the people that don't really care and are just passers by uh, aren't going to do that. Um, and then you have this feature here where you can uh, you can upvote uh questions and so it's kind of like an ama where you upvote the stuff and then we can timestamp them so when i hit start answering here it's going to timestamp this video tied to that question and then later you can come back if you missed it and you can jump straight to the question section and just hit view answer so really cool features there all right let's start with the jedi will 
Hello, Ben. I just took delivery of my Model 3 on Friday. Congratulations. Any apps aside from Teslab and PlugShare that you recommend for new owners? Uh, I, I think I think that would be it. Um, uh, Teslab is the main one, obviously. Uh, you know, I'm I'm clearly biased, <laughs> uh, but I'll, but honestly, before I got involved with the company, I was a fan and a user of it. Um, and yeah, PlugShare. PlugShare is good. Uh, I think I have it installed too, but I don't really use it that much, uh, especially with 310 miles of range. Again, I don't need to charge out and about hardly ever and remember if you do need to charge out and about most at least in southern california most of them are not free so you have to sign up and you have to have an account and blah 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 it's just a big pain in the butt um but yeah it's it's, it's definitely good to have if you drive a lot or where you're at it's important um they also have uh, other things on there but you know in the car you have that information as well so i think tesla labs you know definitely number one it gives you more detailed information about your driving habits those kind of things i think it's just cool um and then you can like have friends become the mayor of a thing when become you know there's like leaderboards for who drove their car to the lowest or you know who went the, the visited the most superchargers etc so i think it's just kind of a fun social uh, experiment as well so congratulations um yeah i mean those are basically uh the top two there other than the tesla app itself mike asks can you explain the details of why Elon Musk says that Tesla has switched from production hell to delivery logistics hell? Just how bid, how, how bad is this delaying delivery? More importantly, what are the reasons for delivery issues and how can you Tesla extract itself from there as quickly as possible? Yeah, I kind of covered that already, Mike. Um, you know, in short, uh, it's a game of whack-a-mole. They're playing it like most businesses do. Uh, Utah, that example has to do with some other weird laws that have been in place for a long time and them trying to get around it. Uh, I think the bulk delivery thing is, is one thing. Other than that, just scaling up, having more people, uh, more delivery centers is definitely the way to go. The problem, of course, is that, you know, right now they're under this giant pressure. And so if you were to like, like they kind of need temporary staff is what they need. And they need to just 10x their delivery stuff, uh, delivery staff tomorrow, um, which then kind of leads to a poor uh, delivery experience. But, you know, a lot of Tesla owners come in already knowing what's going on and they have good instructional videos and stuff. So that's kind of where they're at now. Um, and yeah, you can just rewind if you if you missed the whole bit earlier. Tom asks, could you explain to your listeners how manufacturers and retailers use pricing adjustments to control inventory of demand for their products? As someone in the manufacturing and retailing business, I understand that the confusion and frustration when Tesla makes pricing change to the Model 3, but each time they have done so, it has made complete sense from a business perspective. Elon Musk is not the unstable individual he's made out to be. It all makes sense waiting on the uh, 3D, the dual motor Model 3 with autopilot 18 inch. You gotta get, you gotta upgrade those wheels, Tom. Come on, man. Got it. Yeah. Just can't, can't do it. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm not going to get it's It's a super long answer. Right. But like my thoughts, uh, there's this whole psychology and, and how we've evolved uh, to teach us certain things. And, and that's basically it, you know? Um, so when things cost more, you have, you know, your perception of them is that they're worth more, even though they may not be. Uh, also, you know, things like the, the actual cost and supply, or, you know, if there's an actual cost difference, of course, that, that has to trickle down. Uh, there, there's, there's, so many things it comes it comes down to the psychology of sales um and so there's a great book called uh influence i think it's called which really talks about this so i don't know if you or anyone else is interested i would just go look that up because it talks about things like scarcity reciprocity tricks and, and techniques that companies use to sell things like for example if you know the price like you go into Costco, there's a $4,000 TV right when you walk in. Nobody's going to buy that. They don't even care about selling them. But then when you go see a $100 uh, jar of mayonnaise, you think, oh, that's not bad. You know, the TV was 4000 Even if you don't make that connection consciously, subconsciously you are. So there's all kinds of weird things like that. We as humans are just so gullible and easy to trick so you know I, I don't know what they're doing with that but uh but there's a lot going on so not going to get too deep into it now thanks for the question tom al asks uh can you talk about the economic impact to tesla's revenue for making supercharger a pay per charger service for tesla vehicles not grandfathered into the free life for charging uh can you talk about the economic impact so it costs money to maintain these things um and obviously to the the cost of electricity which i'm still not clear on i sent out an email and i got several people email email me back but nobody 
actually seem to know what they're talking about in terms of like they were the owner of a restaurant that has one. I've heard and I talked to actually some folks here in San Diego where one of them is located that they have to pay for the supercharging electricity. Now, the cost of installing these superchargers is extremely expensive um, and there's maintenance and stuff like that. So, of course, you know, there's an ongoing cost, whether or not they're fitting the bill for electricity, whether or not they're sharing it, whatever. Uh, so this, you know, the idea, I believe, it, as they've stated, is never for this to be a profit center for them. Um, more for it to just be a uh you know kind of covering the cost of it i think it's kind of i don't know i, I think that what they need to do and, and what i hope to see from them is them opening up the actual uh the, the, this to other companies and that with that they, they will they will start to uh they will start to make money on it because that would be nice if you know other vehicles were kind of coming out of the gate like maybe the neo uh whenever that comes to the u.s market would be fantastic if we could just plug right into the network elon has said this is not a, not a not a walled garden this is not a closed system you are welcome to do it nobody has though so it's one of those things uh you know i think it could become an extremely valuable asset for him uh, right now it was definitely just to help people get over the range anxiety fears and things like that thanks for the question now smudger asks based on your info you provided last week i worked out that because it is so much more efficient the actual range of a standard battery model 3 if it is efficient as a longer range 88.3 should have a range only 26 miles less than a 75d model s and 18 miles more than a 75d model x is this really the case or i'm wrong um so you're talking about the clip about the efficiency of trips well i think you're might be misusing those numbers so the way that the efficiency is calculated and i think i talked about it in that video was we look at what the car says it's rated at um, let's say 100 miles and then when you drive how many miles did you actually use so if you drove 100 if you attempted to drive 100 miles and it said 100 miles and you got 90 then you were at 90 percent efficiency now some of the data I want to get to, which I think would would be closer to what you're you're looking at here, is um, is uh, the watt hours per mile. That would be kind of the key thing. Now we've seen that the Model Three is better, but again, there are so many factors that that influence your watt hours per mile. How how you drive, the road conditions, the weather, etc. So. Uh, in general, what you're doing here, I think, is valid. I don't know if these numbers will give you the results that you're thinking, though. I think the watt hours per mile would probably be a better number to, to use. Uh, and unfortunately, that number just doesn't come out of the Tesla API. It's something that we have to try to figure out how to calculate. And it's a lot more nuanced than it may seem. So uh, thanks for the question. And yeah, stay tuned for more data on that. And, and thanks for the thoughtful analysis there. Dennis asks, Hi, Ben. It looks like the Model Y will have some competition when it finally comes to market. Kia Nero and possibly others. I think the Neo, the Chinese one, the ES8 or whatever, is, is, a, is, is a good competitor. Uh, perhaps Tesla should focus on a consumer truck instead of a mid-size SUV. Yeah, I think, I think that ship has sailed. Uh, we're going to see the unveiling maybe later this year, early next year. I mean, we're talking, you know, months away. Uh, and, and, of course, it's going it, to it's gonna sell, you know, tremendously. It's one of those things. Um, <laughs> Mercedes coming out uh, with with an electric SUV, Aston Martin coming out with one, BMW coming out with one, Kia. These are going to sell a lot of Teslas, actually, is, is, is how I think about it, because it's going to really signal to the, the mass market that, like, everything is going electric and it's okay to go electric. And then people are going to look and everything that isn't a Tesla is going to look kind of like uh, 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 not nearly as great. Um, and so it's one of those things. I, I don't think it'll matter because, see, what sells Teslas isn't necessarily the specs of the car. It's the brand. Uh, besides Tesla, Apple used to be the only ones that ever had uh, people waiting in line in the rain to get their latest product. So... I think it's great. I think the more electric cars out there is going to drive demand for Tesla. I, I don't think they have, and competition's a, a, a wonderful thing. Guarantee the Model Y is going to blow all these things out of the water. So, I mean, I don't know. The Again, the Neo ES8, I think, is the only one that looks like it 
is viable. <laughs> um, I don't know about the Kia Nero. I, I need to look into that. So, but yeah, it's all good. I, I, th I think these are all good things. And the crossover market is extremely appealing here in the, un the U.S. I believe it's the biggest one. I did some. I did an analysis on it a while ago. So, no, it totally makes sense. They're already you know well down that path. I don't. I don't think they have anything to worry about. I do. And then of course the next thing is the truck. So you know they're already probably working on on preliminary designs of that. So more to come. Exciting stuff. Bobby G asks, do you have any idea how many of the 450,000 reservations are for the base $35,000 cars, $35, $35 cars? Uh, I got my Model 3 mid-July, and it is the most advanced car in the world, hands down, amazing and worth the wait. I don't. Uh, actually, wait. No, I do. <laughs> I think it was like 35%. So um, on my website, there you have the uh, configurator, the calculator thing to price out your Model 3. And I did that. Uh, so, and I think I've had over 100,000 uh, submissions on that. So some people will be doing multiple but 100,000 results essentially observations and uh, and yeah something like 35 or something percent I, I did a video on it a while ago were people looking at the standard one maybe they were just pricing it out but you know it, it's hard to say unless you actually have Tesla's data what that is so this is like you know probably the best the best largest you know quantity of data you can look at otherwise so that's where I'm that's where I'm guessing um, but we'll see more uh, coming on the earnings call here. We should get an update letter in a couple of weeks about how Q3 went. And I think with that, they were announcing the number of reservations outstanding. So it'll actually be really interesting to see uh, the disparity between what they had last quarter, how many cars they delivered, and how many they have now. Because that'll tell you how many canceled, um, which is like a big narrative out there. But I don't think that's really that true. So, yeah, stay tuned. Jacob asks, uh, price of all-wheel drive and red, the config I want increased by 3.5 thousand. Very disappointed. Elon said the option will cost less than the Model S. Do you believe this is temporary due to supply and demand bottlenecks? Will price keep going up or will it turn to normal? Man, you know what? Uh, scarcity is uh, is is definitely um, definitely something to an incentive to, to to buy. I mean, I would order as soon as you can. Um, there you go. Yeah, I don't know. I, I can't say. Can't, can't say what it is. Can't say it won't won't keep going up. I think it's weird that it keeps going up, but you know, there's probably some, some good reasoning behind it. So thanks for the question, Jacob, and good luck deciding. Ron asks, could you review your rear hitch and bike rack product for Model 3? How do you like it on the utility and experience? Yeah, I haven't put a bike rack on it yet. Uh, I do plan on doing that. It is my wife's car now, so I'm actually not driving it. And um, tow hitch, I'm sorry, Torque Lift Central sent me some fun uh, additional products for the car, so I may do some videos on those soon. Uh, so stay tuned for that. One of them, which is actually a cover for the hole I had to cut in the bumper, um, so anyone that was worried about that, they do sell a thing, um, even though I'm not worried about it. Uh, so uh, you know, I'll probably do a video or mention that um, coming soon when I when I get a chance to actually get around to it. Been traveling, doing a lot of filming and for other things, so haven't really got to it yet. Thanks for the question, Ron. Jason asks. Hi Ben, I've been hi Ben. I've been wondering why does Tesla have different charging ports on the cars for the USA than abroad, like the UK? Why wouldn't they just have one port and then use different adapters and cables? Uh, well, because I believe the electricity in the in the UK, uh, well in Europe, you should say in general, um, is just different. So there's I think a 220 standard uh, volts is the standard current out there, where in the US it's uh, 110. Um, so it's just how electricity works, you know. It's just like different charging ports, like. Why does Apple feel the need to release the same phone and change the charging port? So that way you have to buy a new one. You know, just what they do. Um, they, 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 there's there's sense to it, but I think it's just just a matter of that. And there, are, I believe, are adapters. If you go to the Tesla website, there are like tons of adapters for all different kind of things, even a chat MO adapter and those kind of things. So, thanks for the question, Jason. Franz asks, if I ordered a Model 3 without performance package but haven't received it yet, in body shop getting paint fix, can I cancel it and change the performance with free supercharging? Uh, free supercharging is gone, so no. Um, are there cars out there that still haven't been delivered and are still eligible for free supercharging? Uh, there are, uh, you can buy used ones. Yeah, used Model S and Model X, um, a, a lot of them, even I think maybe new inventory, have free supercharging for life. There you go. Wendell asks, I really enjoy your show. Thank you. Do you feel that Tesla opening up its orders, uh, opening up orders to the public without first working through the reservation list as a slap in the face for reservation holders? I understand wanting to take as much money as possible as selling more expensive version, but I felt that a big I don't care for all the people that put one thousand dollars to reserve a more cost effective model. Yeah, I think these are just the uh, economic realities that Tesla is facing and dealing with. Um, you know, as a company that 
is spending huge amounts of cash to you know do its operations and production it's it's just the reality that they had to deal with and i think we all would would agree that this would be better than say like you know tesla going out of business or something and not you never getting a car those kind of things so it sucks but i, I think it's reality vic asks uh, will the Tesla repair shops be able to repair curb rash? Oh, that's a good point. Um, probably. I, I can't imagine why they wouldn't. That's uh, pretty pretty fair and easy. And, you know, wherever you're at, there's typically lots of local services. I think the guys here in San Diego, they just refer out some other local guy that does it, comes to wherever you're located and, and those kind of things. So, yeah, I don't see why they wouldn't, but I don't know if that would be uh, something they just refer out. Gary asks, uh, why can't you see your music library on screen when you choose to play music from cell phone? I have to keep picking up my phone on the screen. There's a right arrow. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, this, clearly, the UI needs some help um, in so many ways. There's so many features still missing on the Model 3. I don't know. Get a Model S. It's better. Larry asks, Aloha, Ben. I finally picked up my Model 3 performance, and it's everything I hoped for and more. All right. Uh, it's fun to go out and just drive again. My question is about the voice commands for the car. Why doesn't Elon add a list of the commands that one can use? Maybe in the next download. You can probably find it online. Um, it's probably somewhere uh, there. And so, anyways, yeah. It's one of those things where I, I, I think definitely voice is the next big thing in terms of uh advancement in technology right like elon talked about it you know using your thumbs as your interface to this implant this external implant um that you have just not not tenable in, in, in the long haul uh, i think cars are the same way i think most technology is just going to become that way i mean alexa is fantastic um and alexa don't play a song called fantastic right now uh and you know i think amazon really were you know with alexa like we're the first ones to do that uh and then you know from then on out everyone else is trying to kind of humanize tech i, I, th I think we'll get there uh, I, I think it, it'll be something maybe someone online um ha has that already I'm, I'm sure someone posted it but you know typical things play this song navigate here those kind of things so thanks for the question larry a shielded remote pouch is allowed, has allowed my car to sleep much more reliably as remote as long as seen by the car while parked at home. A uh, shielded remote pouch. Okay, cool. I don't know what kind of car you have, but uh, nice. Um, Dave asks, is there a step by is there a step by step uh, directions to see weather with Tesla? You want to go to the in car? Oh, step by step directions. No, I don't think there is that uh we have yeah there's ways and then there's the kind of navigation that that's a good idea though for a feature why don't you um hit me up on twitter or send that over and, and, and i'll forward it to the team thanks dave all right everyone looks like those are all the questions for the day i appreciate you all for joining me yes it is warm yes i am sweating uh but you know you hung in there and, and you got through it anyway so i appreciate you uh more than more than you realize um so thank you for joining me yet again um don't forget the highlight channel and uh, i will see you guys back here next week don't forget until then when you free the data your mind will follow i'll see you guys back here next time cheers